Today we're going to be taking an in-depth look at how to create and generate form 106 A, B, and C for a bankruptcy case. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is go ahead and open up an existing case. So today we're going to be working with Angela and William Snell. All right, once a case is open, we're going to navigate to our property section on our sidebar here on the left hand side. Now that we're here, let's get familiar with this particular section. Right, at the very top right, we have a couple of buttons, View A, B, and View C. These are quick buttons to easily review the forms that we're generating. Across the top, we have several tabs, real estate, vehicles, household, and so forth. These correlate exactly to what you would find on Schedule A, B. So let's start off by creating a new piece of property or real estate. So let's get started by clicking the new button. That's going to bring up our new real estate dialog window. On this dialog window, there is only really one field that is required. You can see that noted by an asterisk, nature of ownership. So let's go ahead and type in purchase money. Here we go. It's not our principal residence. This is going to be a second property that they own. Single family home. Let's give it an address. And we're going to type in a zip code. Let's use our USPS lookup to bring in the city, state, and county. Very nice. And let's give it our acquired date. This was purchased back in 2004, June. And we're going to assign it a value. Let's just put in under description rental home. Perfect. Once we've finished completing everything on this page, we have one additional option. Attach creditor. Essentially, is there a lien holder on this piece of property? And in this instance, the answer is yes. So let's go ahead and click the yes button. Jubilee will give us a drop down of all of the creditors that currently exist in this particular case. But in this instance, it's going to be a brand new creditor. So let's go ahead and add one briefly. We're going to start by clicking the new button. That's going to bring up our secured creditors window. Let's go ahead and type in our creditor's name. Here we go. Let's select Bank of America. Let's select our claim amount. And let's give that a bit of a rearage that has been incurred. Excellent. So we're going to keep it very simple. We're just going to complete those uh, few fields. Hit the Save button. As you see, that claim has already been added here to our list of creditors. I'm going to go ahead and select it. So this is the details tab. The next tab you have is ownership interest. The ownership interest tab is where you can designate how much of this property is owned by each debtor. By default, Jubilee will automatically assign 50% to each one of the debtors in a joint case. If it was an individual case, it would be 100% all to one debtor. In addition to, you can also add other debtors. So there happen to be other individuals that had an ownership interest in this property. You can easily input their information here and give them an ownership percentage. In this case, it's split equally between debtor one and two. So let's go ahead and click save and open. All right, excellent, here we go. That piece of property has been automatically created, added, and is now in our case. So the first thing we're looking at here is the expanded profile view of this particular property. The first tab is the details tab, identical to the one we just reviewed a moment ago. The next tab is liens. So let's go ahead and click on that. And here we'll see a list of all the liens or lien holders that are attached to this piece of property. When we created this property, we selected Bank of America. So as you can see, they've already been added. The amount of the claim and how much of that claim has been applied to this particular asset. There are a couple of instances where the claim amount and the amount applied are going to differ. For example, if the amount of the claim is greater than the value of the property, then the amount applied will differ. So if we were to select it, let's say 175,000, where this property is only worth 125, then we won't see the full amount of the claim applied, simply because we can't apply more than the property is worth or more than the available equity. Another situation where these amounts might differ is when we have cross collateralization. So if this particular lien holder also had a lien on another piece of property, then the amounts might differ. So if that first senior lien was fully secured by the other piece of property, then there wouldn't be any unsecured amount to be applied to this particular piece of property. 
So those are rare instances, but still situations where these numbers can be slightly different. Across the bottom, there's a couple of useful numbers. Uh, first, we have the debtor's interest on the left. What here we represent is how much of the debtor's interest, how much of their equity is actually available. The debtor's interest will differ from the value of the property in the instances where their ownership interest is less than 100%. So for example, if in under the ownership interest tab, if we were, were to have selected that this debtor only has 80% interest in this property, then the interest would be 80% of 125. We would deduct the amount of the lien and their equity would be different than the total equity that is available to the property. By default, Jubilee will automatically assign the amount of the claim that is being assigned to this particular piece of property. But if there is a situation where you need to have more fine tooth control over that, then you can do that by clicking on the lien that you want to adjust. If you were to select the edit button, that is gonna bring up the lien detail screen. As you can see by default, we will auto calculate the amount that's applied. But if you needed to adjust it, simply uncheck and input any amount that you want to have applied from that claim to this piece of property. So let's leave that as the default. Let's go ahead and cancel out of this page. And let's move on to our next section, exemptions. In states where you have available both exemption sets, state and federal, you'll have two tabs for each one. Entry exemptions for each one is identical. We start off by clicking the add button and we have a list of all the available exemptions. So I can start by either scrolling down the list, finding the appropriate exemption, or I can easily use the search bar across the top. For purposes of this demonstration, we're gonna go ahead and select the first exemption that we have here on our list. As you can see, whenever I select an exemption, it's been added here to the bottom. I have the ability to add multiple exemptions if necessary, and there really isn't a limit to how many I can add. For today, we really only want one exemption, so let's go ahead and remove the last couple ones. All right, here we go. The last step is to click the Add button. That exemption has now been added to this particular piece of property. One of the nice features that we have in Jubilee is an exemption calculator. We'll take a look at that in just a moment, but to take full advantage of that, we always encourage users to put in both sets of exemptions where available. So state has been completed. Let's go ahead and do federal. Same process, let's click Add, and let's select an exemption. Before moving on from this screen, I do want to point out that we do have an ability to save these particular exemptions as a default for this piece of property. So in other words, every exemption that I have listed in the exact order that it's being presented can be saved as a default simply by clicking the save icon right here at the top right. The icon next to it is a quick shortcut to our exemption calculator. So let's go ahead and click on that and see where it takes us. Right here we are at the exemption calculator. Another easy way to get here is by going to Tools and Exemption Calculator. The Exemption Calculator presents a side-by-side -side comparison of how state exemptions compare to federal. The easiest way to look at this comparison is by examining the non-exempt line on each side. So we can see that under state, this is the amount that we have non-exempt, and under federal, this is the same amount. It looks like there really isn't any exemptions that are being applied at the moment. To take a closer look, we have two options. First, we can click on Exemptions Applied. What this will do is bring up a list of all of the exemptions that I have added and how they're being applied and to what property in what order. So here I have my exemption that we recently added. It shows me the property or asset that it's being applied to, the amount of equity in that property, and how much of it has been exempted and how much is not exempted. In this instance, there isn't any equity to exempt. All right, let's close out of this dialog and take a look at our second option, Assets. This will bring up a list of all of the assets in your case and the exemptions that have been applied to each one. As you can see, I really haven't applied any exemptions yet. So the only one that I have should be my rental home here across the bottom. As I start adding more exemptions, then we can see that these amounts will change and reflect a more accurate representation of what has been exempted. Let's go ahead and close out. And let's click the back button to take us back to where we left off. So here we are, back at the exemptions tab. The next we're gonna look at is the ownership interest. We reviewed this briefly before, and nothing has really changed in this area. You have control over how much ownership is being designated to each one of the debtors, and you have the ability to add additional owners as well. By selecting community property, it will designate this as a community property property. Right, so let's go ahead and click the back button, 
and that'll bring us back to our main list of property and assets. Next, we're going to take a look at vehicles. Every one of the property tabs works exactly the same way. We navigate to that particular category, we click the new button. The only difference we'll find is that the main details window is changed slightly to reflect the information that is required on the schedule for that particular piece of property. In some instances, there is a subcategory, as we like to call it. For example, here under vehicles, we also have an additional vehicle type, either a motor vehicle or watercraft trailers, motors, and accessories. So by selecting different options, you'll see that some of the fields will change, again, to reflect what is required on the form. Since we already have a couple of vehicles entered, there's no need to add any additional ones. So let's go ahead and click the close button, and let's select one of these particular vehicles. Here we go. As you can see, we have the same exact set of tabs, the same layout as we saw previously. Every one of these pages is designed with that consistency in mind to make it easy to navigate and input the information. In some instances, depending on the type of property or asset that you're creating, we've added a couple of quick links to useful information. For example, here under vehicles, we have a link to the NADA guides and also to Kelly Blue Book. So hopefully that would be helpful information to help you determine the value of this piece of vehicle if necessary. Let's go ahead and click on our back button to bring us back to our main list. And as we navigate down the different types of properties, you can see that they'll be listed here across this middle section. While we're looking here at a list of household items, I wanted to point out a couple of useful bits of information. On the right hand side, we have a number of columns. The first one we're going to look at is exemptions. If I had any of these properties exempted by adding an exemption to it, then we'll see a check mark indicated here. Next is value, which is the actual value of that piece of property. Next is the debtor's value. So this is based on the percentage that I've entered. Liens, if there are any lien holders or claims against this particular piece of property, and the remaining equity. At the very bottom right, we have a total of all of the assets in this particular category. That same total can be found here on the tab. We have designated the amount and the quantity of assets that you have entered. So we'll continue working our way down the different parts or categories of the property section. We have financial assets, business related assets, farm and fishing, and other assets. Basically, anything else we can't find a correct designation for. So once you've completed inputting all of the information, you do have the schedule to view and review. So let's go ahead and click on schedule AB, and we'll see that all of the property that we have entered has been listed with all the correct fields completed. Like always, from this form preview window, you do have the ability to navigate the different parts by using the dropdown, printing, or generating a PDF of this particular schedule. All right, so let's go ahead and close out, and let's look at the next schedule, which is C. As you can see, we have a rental home here that is the only property we have with an exemption applied, the amount of exemption we're claiming, and the specific law. So all the information we have previously entered is automatically pushed to the form. All right, so let's go ahead and click the close button. And that completes today's review of how to complete Form 106A, B, and C. And like always, we invite you to view any of our other tutorials.